Um, and why don't you thank you all for showing up tonight, and, and uh, we're really excited about this particular forum. It's the first one of 2023, and I believe it's the first in-person forum we've had since 20. <coughs> Have a, we have a great um, array of presenters, so I think you're going to enjoy that. We have highly technical scientific presenters, and then we have some more uh, less technical at, at the moment. But um, I would like to acknowledge Bridget Fleming, our county legislator, who's here tonight. Bridget has been immensely helpful to us in the marsh re restoration project and the mosquito methoprene reduction um, and using scientific sampling to determine appropriate dosing for Delta the marsh. So we really, really appreciate everything you've done. And I know um, Anne Weckler is here who's running for Bridget's. Uh, Anne Welker is running for my seat. <laughs> Okay. Oh, there you are. Thank you. So we'll we'll start. Um, we have presenters, and we have Q and A at the end. Depending on if we have enough time, we'll reduce the Q and A, or we'll keep it at the uh, budgeted amount right now. But the first presenter is Christopher Gobler. From the center, he's a director of the Center for Clean Water Technology. He's also um, a, a very distinguished professor at Stony Brook at the um, SOMAS um, organization. And we're very delighted to have him here to reflect on 10 years of sampling science in Akabai Park. Okay, well, good evening, everyone. Good to see everybody. Hope everybody is well. Um, Back here, I can't remember. I know I was here for, I think it was the Georgia Capone event. It might have been 2019 even, or maybe. Anyway, um, happy to talk about Akabonic Harbor. Uh, I saw Francis Bach is here, the head of the town trustees. And the trustees have been supporting monitoring of actually all East Hampton waters for a decade now. Um, so I'm going to just be leaning on that data set and uh, talk about what we see and what we've been seeing in Akabonic Harbor uh, essentially since 2013. And in doing that, I'll just acknowledge the fine young men and women from my lab who are really the ones who are uh, the boots on the ground and the fins in the water who are doing really all the great work uh, that's happened in Akabonic Harbor. And of course, as we think about Akabonic Harbor, we'll think about it in terms of a watershed uh, and the idea that everything that's happening in the surface waters is purely a function of what's going on in the land surrounding it. Uh, so land use uh, looms large there and, and is doubly important because not only is it, in effect, of course, affecting surface waters, but it's also affecting our sole source aquifer, which is the water we drink every single day. Um, and we know for a lot of Long Island that um, most of the nitrogen that's entering surface waters is coming largely from wastewater and then secondarily um, from fertilizer. So in preparing for this presentation, in addition to leaning on my own data over the last decade, I did scour the uh, literature available for Akabotic Harbor in general. And uh, when I do that for any water body, I always lean on the Suffolk County sub-watershed study. But surprisingly, actually, Akabonic Harbor was not studied in, the, uh, in, in this incredibly comprehensive plan, right? So here's a plan for more than 220 some odd sub-watersheds. And I was part of the planning for this, and so I, you know, I totally get that certain, you know, they, not everything got made its way in. And there were discussions about individual water bodies. I don't recall what the discussion was for Akabana Carver. Um, but it's, in my mind, kind of a big deal that it's not in there. Because frankly, we don't know. And therefore, because of that, there's a lot we don't know about Akabana Carver. I'm going to talk about the things we do know. But there are missing pieces for sure. Now, I did know that predating this report, which came out in 2020, um, 
the Nature Conservancy did do a nitrogen loading study for all of the Peconic estuary. And so they did happen to carve out a watershed for Akabonic Harbor. But I'll have you note, of course, here's Akabonic Harbor, here's the, what they used as a sub-watershed, right? And so it goes all the way to Nat Peak Harbor, um, so clearly not the actual sub-watershed for Akabonic Harbor. Um, so we're missing the, the important pieces, you know, for, for this sub-watershed, we could say that, again, 60% of the nitrogen was coming from wastewater and 30% was from fertilizer. Um, but that is kind of a key component uh, that I think is outstanding, and uh, we can think about trying to get that information going forward, I think it's important. Um, just thinking about what I do for these Hannah Town trustees, and I've done in Akabana Carver, we're looking at general water quality, harmful algal blooms, um, potentially uh, what we call indicator bacteria, in indicative of fecal contamination, using um, molecular approaches to identify where those fecal bacteria might be coming from. And we also recently did a uh, sediment survey of the whole harbor. Um, and, you know, most of the lab we work in, even though I'm a professor at Stony Brook, I've always been at the Southampton campus, so my research lab is there, so we're getting water samples from here, bringing them out there, and always trying to analyze the data in light of federal, state, and local water quality um, this just gives you a sense of all the different places we've been sampling at East Hampton more recently. Uh, within Akabonic Harbor, we've had uh, over the years about uh, six different stations. Uh, we've sort of jogged back and forth on a couple of these stations. So I'm just going to jump in the data because there's a lot of data to talk about, and I'll try to walk you through what it all is. And the first piece of data I'm going to talk about is something called chlorophyll A. Uh, chlorophyll is the molecule in all plants and on planet Earth. Uh, it evolved about 3 billion years ago and is still in all plants. And um, this just shows you a whole bunch of different uh, marine water bodies. This is for 2022. I'm going to give the retrospective momentarily. Um, and it shows you both the maximal levels of chlorophyll that we saw uh, last year as well as the mean levels. And you know, what jumps out is Akabonic Harbor is the, actually the only water body where all the sites hit a maximum above what the EPA sets as a level you wouldn't want to exceed. Because above that, you begin to have this sort of cascading set of events that can lead to low oxygen and other adverse outcomes. Uh, you know, on average, it wasn't all that bad, but, you know, the maximum definitely quite high. If we look over 10 years, and I just recently worked up this data, Trends like kind of surprising in that when we first started monitoring everything looked pretty low uh, Right around this like you know, Noah maybe would say well below five is good So we were right in that range But in recent years we've been on the rise and you know again. There's a data point down here. So um, You know, maybe things will come back down. Maybe this is indicative of a phase shift. I should just mention that station six one furthest to the west. Uh, and so this sort of gradient is anticipated. Station five is right by the inlet, and so we don't see, we expect that to be very clear and clean and well flush, whereas this is what we call more of a back bay region. Um, so the spatial trend makes sense. The temporal trend is a little, frankly, a little surprising. Um, we also do think about harmful algal blooms, and specifically, Waters we worry about probably the most is this one, Alexandrium. Um, it creates this toxin or contains this toxin, saxitoxin, which can lead to something called paralytic shellfish poisoning. Um, and we do see this organism. This is a just 2022 data, but we've seen it throughout Akamano Harbor. Um, now, thankfully, these are not super high levels, um, but they're also, you know, we're, we're, we're getting towards what would be a level at which shellfish could become contaminated. And just to, to put some color here, um, this is a real event. Currently, I think this year we've had six different estuaries close to shell fishing because of biotoxins, and four or five of the six were because specifically of saxotoxin. It's never happened in Akabana Harbor or East Hampton Waters, thank goodness, but there's been a couple of close calls in Three Mile Harbor. But I just point out that it is something that happens, and on the east end in particular. In fact, all of the closures this spring have been um, in, I'd say, eastern Long Island, Rich Basin, Conconic Estuary. Uh, so these levels, you know, 
at least this one here, you're getting towards what could be a troubling level. Um, this is, as you can see by the dates, a spring event in the summer. We think about and worry about rust tides. This is what we call an ichthyotoxic algae. No toxins for humans. I've actually swam, accidentally swam in waters with rust tide. Uh, no ill effects, but it does produce a, uh, a compound that can, be, that can kill fish uh, and bivalves as well. And through the years, I just have sort of some snapshots and highlights. We have seen this event be pretty intense in Akabana Harbor. Um, so here's data, for example, from 2020. And um, we know that above 300 cells per milliliter, this can, be, this can cause a fish kill. So we've seen that as maximal levels, uh, individual um, levels within Akabana Harbor, two of the three stations. Also in um, uh, 2017, a situation well, we were above that threshold, um, but not as bad as Three Mile Harbor. And then 2014 was a year that was like a complete surprise. We typically would expect this rust hot in late in the summer. And we used to think before this year that actually it was starting to the west and spreading to the east. And this year it showed up first in Akabana Harbor uh, and then went away. And it actually, that, you know, thereafter it was in Three Mile Harbor. Uh, I'm not saying it's spreading from one to the other, but it was, a pr it was very surprising that this was the first place it showed up. Uh, but the temporal difference, excuse me, the spatial difference uh, has been consistent where it's, you know, Three Mile Harbor would be the head of the harbor, specifically be the worst, and then Akabonic Harbor behind it. Um, another symptom of that high chlorophyll I already mentioned, on the one hand during the day that chlorophyll will make lots of oxygen, but at night it can consume a lot of oxygen. And so here we're looking at in the red, the minimum oxygen levels. And so, again, Akabana Harbor actually had lower DO, daytime DO minimums uh, than all the other sites. Somewhat, su well, surprising, maybe partly accounted for, we're gonna hear about salt marshes, and salt marshes are, are ecosystems in and of themselves that can consume a lot of oxygen, so that might partly explain it. Uh, but also the high levels of chlorophyll uh, would also Uh, we also measure the total amount of nitrogen in, in, in the water body. Uh, and the Peconic Estuary Program had in the past had a threshold value of 0 0.4 uh, milligrams per liter. This is to protect um, seagrass beds. And you can see both on, uh, for maximum and on average, we're, you know, for several of those stations, we're exceeding that. Not the Laos Point station, which is by the inlet, but once you get to the back, levels are nitrogen high. So these are all. These all fit together sort of like a puzzle. The high nitrogen leads to the high levels of algae, which can then lead to the low levels of oxygen. Um, one thing we've started doing in recent past is starting to map out surface water quality using this thing we have called a high cat. It's a pontoon vessel that uh, runs from, a sh from shore. You can pre-program it. It just goes and embedded within it. We've got water quality sensors. Um, and so you can map out some of these different variables that we've uh, been discussing. So just to show you now just a little bit of what we've done with that, um, we don't have as complete of a data set as we'd like for Akabonic Harbor. We're gonna try again this summer. Uh, but it does, has revealed some interesting trends. Like here with temperature, as we'd expect, you get warmer. This is, I think, because it was in the fall, uh, a little bit warmer water coming in uh, out of the estuary, cooler actually within the uh, harbor. You can imagine that um, come this time of year, this trend would actually be reversed. Uh, and then with chlorophyll, again, this really emphasizes that pattern I talked about before, where lower levels out where you get nice flushing by the inlet, and then higher levels in the back bay region. Uh, we did mapping the year prior, and it's the Color coding is different here. Here is just shades of green, but you see a, basically a similar trend. We did we sort of caught an in and end out end out going tide here, but at least in the f areas further back, the darkest green revealing the highest levels of chlorophyll. So the other general um, category of water quality that we look at is fecal bacterial contamination, uh, and so specifically, and and this is certainly something that is monitored not just by my lab, but like for example, the DEC monitors this for shellfishing. The DOH wants to look at these values to de deem whether a water body is swimmable or not. Um, and so we're looking at uh, different 
types of uh, what we call indicator bacteria. They're indicative of fecal contamination. Uh, and we're using molecular methods to parse out where those bacteria might be coming from. And then also considering all sorts of what we call <coughs> physical oceanographic processes that may be actually physically delivering this into the water body. Um, there are two different classes of bacteria we're looking at, and for good reasons. Uh, the DEC, when they decide whether a shell, an area should be open or closed to shell fishing, they, use, uh, they measure something called fecal coliform bacteria, whereas the state health department um, and the county health department likes to use uh, enterococcus as the a more um, granular, fine scale, uh, better indicative for, for for those of you who don't know, the current status for shell fishing in Akabonic Harbor is displayed right here, uh, and that is there's a large area that is open year-round to shell fishing. The two areas in the red are always closed to shell fishing, and then everything in the blue is what we, is seasonally closed. So that is to say that between uh, May 1st and November, and November 30th, it, there's no shell fishing, but when the conditions are better in the winter, it's open. Uh, and so our stations are actually kind of in some ways you know, station seven, one of our station seven areas are, are close to here, and um, anyway, we, we try to sort of straddle some of these uh, areas. Uh, and I'll just emphasize that my lab has gone through a lot of effort to gain what's known as ELAP certification. This is a certification that's given out by the state health department. ELAP stands for Environmental Laboratory Accreditation Program. Um, and. I can just say it's it's a lot of work, and you you literally get inspected by the state health department every year, and you you there's every time we get a whole list of citations. Here are all the things you did wrong, and you know it's it's like you didn't record the temperature of the incubator on the Friday before Christmas. There's a lot to it, but um, you know we feel it's important for having solid data that we can. Um, this is. Technically, what this leads to is what is known as legally defensible data that would hold up in a court of law, um, which is actually beyond like the general academic standards. Uh, and I think most, there's, um, the DEC would have this sort of data, the health department would have this sort of data, but that's, that would, it, would, it would end there. Okay. And again, just a reminder of our stations. So this is the 2022 data for fecal coliform bacteria. And uh, you can see where the stations are, and you can see the trends. So that station back here, I believe that's like by Shipyard Lane, you know, almost always. Now, that's an area that's closed seasonally, so, you know, appropriate, but very high levels. Um, whereas the areas that were, um, and the other two seasonal areas also had overtures. But even this 7B site, which should be open, we actually found higher levels or levels above that on certain days. So that's something that... It's obviously worth following up on. Um, when we look at the uh, enterococcus as a swimming standard, uh, we see fewer exceedances. General spatial patterns are the same. Um, I will just say it's you know I don't have the rainfall data up here, but we did. You know, you'll note at least for most of the stations during the summer, you know this area here, and you know, maybe I'm looking into it too much, but. But part of what you see here is can be a function of rainfall events also. That is to say, if you have, you know, what delivers that material from land to sea usually is heavy rainfall. And that will be emphasized momentarily. Um, I did, again, plot the temporal trends. <laughs> they look actually a lot like the chlorophyll trends in that, um, you know, the levels that we are, have been seeing in the last several years, we'll say the last four, are seemingly higher than the ones we saw in the five years before that. Um, would want to look more into that, but it's not, it's not moving the direction we necessarily would want it to be moving in. I think the last thing I'm going to talk about here is our microbial source tracking. So this is using, again, molecular DNA-based approaches um, to actually look at the bacteria in the microbiome of these animals, right? So, Everybody's probably heard of microbiomes by now. We all have our own microbiome. And as it turns out, each of these individual organisms have unique microbiomes and unique bacteria that you won't find in the others. So we have DNA probes to target and quantify those bacteria so we can discriminate amongst, you know, and the terms come to mind, whose poop is it? <laughs> <laughs> and so I just have a few different years of data here. They all look quite similar. 
uh, this is the 2022 data, the answer we generally get is it's usually birds and either this other class, we can't quite discriminate dogs from small mammals, their microbiomes overlap a bit. Um, but that's generally what we're seeing. So here's the really important thing. It's not human-based bacteria, and I can say that, that for sure. I'm going to show you many years of data, and that makes perfect sense. Um, septic tanks and pools are cited, as you, if you don't know, uh, maybe some of you do have private wells, but if you had a private well, you could have your septic tank just 100 feet from your well. You know, now you have to be 200 feet, but you had an older system. And the reason is that bacteria are retained very well in the aquifer and in sand. So, and, and therefore, we don't expect septic tanks to be leaching any of these fecal bacteria into surface waters. And certainly the data shows that. Um, and if anything, when we do see a human bacteria signal, it's sometimes, let's see if I can show it here, you know, we, we saw here and we've seen in other cases where there's boats around, sometimes boats can be uh, the source. But, and, and so when we see birds in particular, to me, that's like, obviously that's the most natural of all the sources, right? And that's probably somewhat linked to all the salt marshes there and all the birds using that as, as habitat. Um, but again, you know, going back in time now, here's 2020, and again, you're seeing a lot of either the bird signal or the dog um, and small mammal. Laos Point, again, with some boats, is the one area that had tended to be the exception. Um, and then this was the first time we did it, and we interestingly saw uh, the Shipyard Lane site receiving fresh water from Pussy's Pond that it looked like there was a linkage there, so specifically um, high levels, specifically of the bird signal coming in there and then washing its way into the Shipyard Lane site. Oh, very last thing. It's okay, okay. <laughs> well, we did a sediment survey of Akabonic Harbor last year uh, discussing with the trustees. They're thinking potentially about dredging a partic some particular sites. You want to know something about what's in the sediment there. Um, so we sampled 20 different locations, looked at sediment grain size, organic matter content, and also depths of muds. Um, there's a lot of data to look through, um, but this is just showing the largest uh, size sediments. I think I'm going to skip that one in of time. Uh, here, finer grain sediments, and what you'll see is that the, the kind of the opposite of the last one, the larger grain sediments are the areas that are closer um, for example, by the inlet here and here, um, here and here, uh, and the finer grain stuff back by the salt marshes. Um, similar pattern with sediment, organic matter content, high. So this is, um, well, I'll talk more about how they're all linked. But again, clo the area close to the inlet uh, and sort of more mid-channel um, has less organic matter. Uh, and also this links with muds as well. So, these, so that is the areas that had large grain material that had less organic matter were also more likely these sandy muds or muddy sands as classification. And so, uh, and then the areas far from the inlet where as we found lots of you know, the mud thickness in some cases here approaching almost 10 feet worth of mud. And in many years of accumulation. The way I like to think about these sediments in mud is that you know, we were, this was a glacier 10,000 years ago, it's all been filling in since then. Right, so we've had 10 years worth of, uh, excuse me, uh, 10,000 years to, uh, to contribute the 10 feet of mud that's accumulated at the far end. Um, and just showing in general, you know, the deeper the mud, the more organic matter that is in there. That is, the muds are rich in organic matter and also in fine grain sediments. And I think that's what's shown here, um, the areas where we had more of the uh, large grain sediments had lower organic matter and vice versa. Okay, so with that, I'm done, and uh, I'll see any additional. Well, I'll thank uh, the trustees for all their support, uh, and uh, and look forward to discussions and the other. Yeah. Our next presenters are from the Peconic Estuary Partnership, and Joyce Novak is the executive director. Interacting with Joyce for the past many years on the Citizens Advisory Committee and also the Technical Advisory Committee. We did and you come to our board meeting, so we really enjoyed working with you. Um, same here. Thank you very much, uh, Patrice. I'm just going to pull up. Oh, do we have to have? Yeah.
Um, so my name is Joyce Novak. I'm the executive director of the Peconic uh, National Estuary Program. Um, I'm here with my colleague, Jade Blanau. She is our climate adaptation and community uh, coordinator, which means she really focuses on uh, adaptation techniques, specifically nature-based uh, solutions to some of our problems. And of course, wetlands fall into that overarching category. Uh, Agabonic is very lucky that they have um, the beautiful wetland that they do. Um, and Jade is going to talk a little bit about that in just a second. Um, and so for those of you who don't know, um, a national, national estuary program uh, was set up by the EPA in the 80s uh, to protect and fund in a collaborative effort. And I'm like, Um. Um, so really to, to um, identify estuaries of national significance around the country, uh, so there's 28 of them that were identified. In 1993, PEP was formally designated. Um, we can credit Suffolk County for that. Suffolk County was the entity who nominated us to Congress. Um, and there was a lot of local support. We're one of, the, uh, we're the only program that was really locally driven. Every other program was state designated. Um, and so I think that's really significant in how we operate today and how closely we work with not just local governments and the county, um, but our towns and our communities. Um, so. What's, the other thing I want to point out is um, we're a consensus-based community organization. So that means that all of our decisions are made through our series of committees and by our citizens. Um, and so just uh, very briefly, uh, you know where Agabana Harbor is. This is the Peconic Watershed. Um, to just give you an idea, um, in the Peconic Estuary, there's more than 100 distinct bays, harbors, embayments, and tributaries with 158,000 surface water acres and about 112,000 land acres. So we are responsible for really uh, helping to manage all of that um, and in large part um, bring funding to the area. So we are federally funded. That is our base funding, New York State and Suffolk County. Um, and for the past two years, the East End towns match and exceed that funding. Um, last year, or is it two years ago now, under the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, national estuary programs are recognized as a good way to get money out on the ground, in the door, out the door. So we have about a million dollars a year um, that we will be using around the estuary. Um, and we're guided by a comprehensive management plan. We worked with all of our committees back in 2018, 19. It was released in 2020 um, to really hone in on our mission and our four goals, which are strong partnerships, resilient communities, clean water, and healthy ecosystems. And this is really our guiding document. Everything we do falls under this. I encourage you to go look at it on the website um, because there's a lot of really good information there and actions that drive what we do. Um, and so one of those things, of course, is the project at Agabonic Harbor. And so I'll just introduce Jade, uh, who's going to talk to you a little bit about that. Hello, everyone. First of all, thank you so much for having us. And I'm going to introduce you to Agabonic Harbor. And I just want to say, with Christine Ganich as my witness, I love this project. And I will talk to anyone at any time about it. So please feel free to engage with me after this. So. This is Akabonic Harbor. Some of the key elements that I want to point out is that all the activities that have gone on around here are really partnership-fueled, data-driven, and are embracing this regional emerging restoration technique that I see as having the potential to really change salt marsh restoration on the Northeast. All right, before we get into project-specific things, I want to make sure that I love salt marshes and you love salt marshes for all of the same reasons. 
So this is a graphic from a recently published paper that is talking all about how do we evaluate why we should invest in salt marshes and salt marsh restoration. And as you see, there's many to choose from. But I would say that when we invest in salt marsh restoration, we're really investing in coastal resilience. We're investing in flood mitigation. We're investing in habitat and carbon sequestration. And this paper really, really shows that. And I hope that it convinces you that this work is important and those ecosystem services really should be driving our decision making and public funds. So, unfortunately, our salt marsh systems are having a bit of a struggle lately. And a lot of those struggles are due and related to our salt marsh elevation. So that kind of leads us to our first vocab word of subsidence. A marsh that's on a subsidence trajectory is slowly breaking down. It's becoming smaller and smaller in elevation on that marsh platform. On the other hand, a healthy marsh is accreting sediment on the marsh platform, and that will drive it to sustain itself into the future. Um, unfortunately, on Akabonic Harbor, we are currently in a subsidence trajectory, so we are facing a dysfunctional wetland that is essentially drowning and we're having loss of habitat, there's water logging, and this subsistence trajectory is not going to be able to push us into the future. Um, with sea level rise, it's just we need to be keeping up with sea level rise in an accretion um, mechanism in order to move on into the future. And Unfortunately, also, that we're not the only ones facing this. Um, in the Peconics, high marsh has been lost. That habitat has been lost at 25% since the 70s. And that's really bad news if we're thinking about coastal resilience factors, as well as if you are a salt marsh sparrow and you need high marsh to survive. And salt marsh sparrows in this scenario, although they're only one endangered bird, they are an indicator species. And they're telling us we're dying because there was a crisis going on. And that is why the studying them is important. So there's a couple of factors that are laced into the context of this project. And first, I would say is this mosquito larvae program. The mosquito larvae program was a citizen science endeavor. And it really helped to highlight that there was hydrologic <coughs> dysfunction happening on the marsh. The second aspect is that TNC recognized that hydrologic dysfunction and then created their initial project. They kick-started this project into engaging with a regional group called Smart Teams. They got some conceptual designs on their lands and engaged in the spirit of partnership, this stakeholder event. And we really have Nicole Marr to thank for getting us connected with the Smart Teams. And she really has pushed that forward in so many ways. And that's how I got brought into this project, and I'm so thankful. And now PEP is working with Suffolk County. We've secured $150,000 of capital funds to push this project forward. We're going to continue to expand and develop these plans. So a little bit more in depth, this citizen science mosquito larvae project. So the aim of this project was to identify breeding area hotspots on Akabonic Harbor. That identification of where hotspots were within, within the water allowed us to then inform Suffolk County Vector Control. And through informing Vector Control, they were able to make data-driven decisions. And when you're able to make data-driven decisions because of your citizen science, that is the greatest success of a citizen science program and is truly inspiring. And ultimately, that data collection led to Suffolk County Vector Control reducing the application of pesticides, which is Truly, like everyone that was involved with that, thank you so much. Those Monday morning samplers and every single partner. I truly believe that on top of reducing pesticide um, use on Akabonic Harbor, exposure, saving money, saving time, it also increased transparency on how Suffolk County Vector Control makes their decisions, which is extremely important. But on top of all of those wins, it also highlighted that at the heart of this problem, there was a hydrologic dysfunction happening, and that data is now at the center of these designs. So that takes us to the Nature Conservancy and their research, building upon all of that mosquito larvae hotspot data, building upon their installed salt marsh ele elevation tables. Like I said, salt marsh elevation is so important to this. Those salt marsh elevation tables allow us to have hard data that track how marsh accretion and subsidence is happening. 
those two data sets on top of salt marsh sparrow breeding population surveys, that's a lot of data for you to design a well thought out project. And that's what we have. And TNC partnered with that Smart Teams regional groups. They created those initial conceptual designs and hosted an amazing stakeholder engagement workshop that allowed us to really be a part of this and push this forward. So thank you again. So who are smart teams? I keep talking about them. It's because I'm obsessed with them. So, so smart is salt marsh adaptation and resilience teams. So these are some of the amazing representatives of smart teams that are doing this work and helping to push this project forward. At the heart of smart teams, I really see it as they are taking the time to recognize the history of the site that they are at in order to restore the mechanisms by which marshes are able to heal themselves. And that is powerful stuff. And I will talk about it forever. If you want to read more, the Farmers in the Marsh publication really talks about how this is a regional effort and it's set up to expand to have a larger complex of projects. So within this approach, what do I mean when I say the history of a site? It's really that if you can recognize the sense of place, you really know what your site is like. Not only is there mosquito ditching when you first look at a marsh like Mara Lake over there, and you say, oh, look, at the, that's mosquito ditching from the 1900s. We are learning and recognizing that in the history of farming the marsh for salt hay and other salt tolerant crops, that there were other features such as um, there's regular ditching, there was terracing, there are embankments. These are all, all features that are still changing the way in which water moves through and on top of the marsh. If we can recognize this, that knowledge gives us power to make more thoughtful designs. So in these steps, we, they, we first are identifying where are these ditches, embankments, a mega pool. A mega pool is where an area where the marsh just can't handle it anymore, it is drowning. Once you look at the same aerials and you can define based off of the way in which the plants are responding to this hydrology, you're then gonna go into the, into the field and ground truth. And at Nicole Mar's amazing workshop, we went, into the, <laughs> we went into the field, we looked to confirm all of the thoughts on where we thought embankments were, where we thought ditches were, and you also can identify zombie ditches, which are extremely interesting. I'm gonna take a second to explain them. We ran around the marsh with these ski poles and you run around smashing them into the marsh. And in certain areas, they will go straight down, while in other areas, you'll hit sand pretty quickly. And those changes are fully because there's a zombie ditch in some areas. So that's where in the 1700s or 1800s, someone wanted to drain an area of the marsh, but in the amazement of the marsh, it healed itself over. And so from aerial footage, and when you just look at it, you have no idea that really tons of water is being able to be pushed through these zombie ditches. And it needs to be part of your plans when you are trying to fix the mechanisms of hydrology. So that's an example of some of the work on the top right, all of these crazy colors and, and lines of what is really going on hydrologically with water. And once you are able to map out your tide shed or that one area, you then are restoring to single channel hydrology. I'm gonna just so single channel hydrology, we're gonna like reference this bottom right picture. So if we can bring this area, which is a singular tide shed, back to a single channel, ideally this marsh will have one central vein that water and the incoming tide has lots of energy and is holding sediment. That energy is pushing up into the mouth of that channel and you're hoping that it has enough energy to push sediment up and disperse it across the marsh. That's where we get our accretion from. The ability for the marsh to continuously grow is because there is enough energy for that sediment to be pushed onto the marsh platform. When we have legacy ditching and lots of hydrologic dysfunction, we can see it right here. That arrow is that energy being pushed up. It is not being tunneled in a way that will allow it to be pushed into the marsh platform. Instead, it's being, that energy is dispersed immediately. And that is one reason why we are having marsh subsidence in the way that we are. So if we can restore for single channel, we're actually restoring for the mechanism of the marsh to heal itself. So once all of this thoughtful design is happening, it's then 
the SMART teams then are promoting this minimally invasive approach. Instead of mass regrading our marshes to make them something totally new, we're working with already established features. And that kind of looks like small hydrological changes. There are small runnels that are allow for drainage in areas that you need to be connected, and cord grass fill can be used to treat areas that are overly ditched. And a really important aspect of this is that this is regional shift in thinking of what does it mean to do salt marsh restoration. And SMART teams are deeply dedicated to continuous learning, data sharing, improving their restoration approaches in all of their pilot sites that they've already done this at, as well as, as well as that this, um, sorry, that this project itself is one project that will push the evolution of salt marsh restoration into the future. And Akabonic is going to be the example on Long Island, and PEP is looking to show that when we are choosing how to tackle other projects. This is the future, and I'm so happy to be a part of it, and I really appreciate being a part of this project. So the next steps that we're looking at are that there is $150,000 of Suffolk County money that is capital funds that are secured. Um, this money is going to be used to expand the project footprint. It's going to expand onto public lands, and we're going to further these designs through permitting. On top of that, we're working to help people to better understand what permitting like this even looks like when you're working with brand new types of salt marsh restoration design. On top of this, because Nicole Marr's workshop was such an amazing hit and we learned so much, we are deeply committed to continuing those workshops. We think that building capacity and knowledge of this technique on Long Island is vitally important. As marshes, like I said, around Long Island are subsiding, marshes, we are losing them quickly. We need to build the capacity and have people recognize that there is more than one way to fix a salt marsh and this might be the better way for the project area that you're looking at. So, Axel will continue to lead the way in this new wave of salt marsh restoration. Thank you. And thank you to all of the partners that made this happen. Batham from Cornell Cooperative Extension. Thank you. My name is Molly Grafham. I work with Cornell Cooperative Extension, and I'm giving this presentation on behalf of me and my colleague Ron Paulson. Today, I'm going to talk about groundwater nitrogen remediation. That Akabon and Harbor, if you were at this event last year, I think we did have an in-person event where um, I gave a talk last year that was focused on mostly the northwest region that we, some of the work we were doing there. So I'm going to switch gears and talk about this southwest region. We've been studying um, this area around Pussy's Pond and the culvert that connects Pussy's Pond to southwestern Akabon and Harbor since about 2016, so just to orient you, this is the highway and the spruce. So we've been studying this area since about 2016 and with support of the Act Bonding Protection Committee. They've um, helped provide a lot of the preliminary, uh, help support a lot of the preliminary work here, but a lot of our work is geared towards locating areas where there is a lot of nitrogen in the groundwater and high groundwater flow rates. So we call them these nitrogen hotspots and that's where the remediation and the treatment and the nitrogen removal will be best served. So this is an area, a focal area, and um, I'm gonna go over some of the data actually. We have, back in 2016, we installed what's called a permeable reactive barrier, which is a subsurface groundwater treatment system. It uses natural materials like wood chips and gravel, and it's all below ground, and it intercepts groundwater that's contaminated with nitrogen, and through 
natural microbial processes, that nitrate is converted into harmless nitrogen gas, which is it in right now. It's 80% of our atmosphere. So this type of treatment takes nitrogen from in the groundwater, converts it to the harmless form that's in the air. And along the western shoreline of Pussy's Pond, this type of system was installed back in 2016, and we've been able to monitor it um, over several years. So what I'm showing here is data from one of the representative treatment cells. Um, so the line graph here is showing pore water in red, which is basically the untreated water that's entering the system. And the blue water, the blue line is the treated water. And on the left-hand side of this graph here is showing the concentrations of nitrate in milligrams per liter. On the right-hand side, I'm showing the percent nitrate reduction. So Within the PRB, we were typically seeing 20 to 40 percent nitrate removal in cooler months and 60 to 80 percent nitrate removal during the warmer months. It's related to the um, metabolism of the microbes that are doing this reaction. So they're just generally slower and not functioning as well in cooler months. And then when the temperature ramps up, they're able to remove more nitrogen. So had studied this area for since 2016, as I was saying, and so we have a time series of data along this western shoreline of Pussy's Pond. Um, what I'm showing here is the nitrate concentration that we were seeing entering the permeable reactive barrier, and as you can see, we, ha we see this trend, average nitrate concentration increasing uh, over the years. So we think important to time series data is really important like Dr. Gobler showed a lot of time series data and um, our trend seems to be increasing especially along the western shoreline of Pussy's Pond. In all of 2021 we revisited this site so previously our measurements of what was entering the permeable reactive barrier were rather shallow depths below the ground but we decided to install a well a few feet up gradient of the system, and we did what's called a profile well. So it's a temporary well that gets installed at a relatively deep depth. In this case, it was installed 20 feet below the ground level. And then we retract the temporary well, and we can sample the nitrogen in the aquifer at different levels. So we found in this area the highest nitrogen concentration was 19.8 milligrams per liter, and about half of that nitrogen was in the form of nitrate, half was in the form of ammonium. And just to give you some sense here, pristine upper glacial aquifer groundwater has less than one milligram of nitrogen per liter. So these are really high values in the groundwater that we're measuring. So this is another piece of data um, that highlights that this shoreline is highly impacted by nutrient and actually, since 2016, when this system was installed, we've learned quite a bit about permeable reactive barriers. And we, a lot of our research is focusing on improving them, making them more cost effective and more efficient. So I really think that this site is something to focus on, again, to do more monitoring and also potentially bolster the treatment in this area to protect the, the pond. Um, we also started to measure fecal coliforms in the groundwater, the pore water, and the surface water in this area. Um, so as Dr. Gobler explained earlier, fecal coliforms are from the intestines of warm-blooded animals. So it's um, water contaminated with fecal coliforms. If it's ingested, it's going to cause um, a lot of issues for humans if it continues. Um, and we just wanted to know, is the fecal coliform, is it present in groundwater? Is it present in surface water? How much is present there? Like, we didn't expect to see it present in the groundwater. As Dr. Gobler explained earlier, it's typically, bacteria are typically well absorbed to soils. So we didn't anticipate finding it in groundwater, but we just wanted to make sure that it wasn't there. So we did some sampling, sorry, we did some sampling of the, the groundwater. And again, we found less than the detectable levels in 
groundwater, so this confirmed what we anticipated. But we also looked at the poor water in this area, which is the, the poor water is this mixture of, it can be a mixture of surface water and groundwater, but it's really um, the water that's present in the sediment and in areas where there's high groundwater flow, it's gonna be mostly groundwater that's moving through the sediment up into the surface water. So we found at the Pussy's Pond site that in the surface water, there were really high levels of fecal coliform, which is consistent with other data that's been collected there. And we also found high levels of fecal coliform in the surface water southwest corner of the Springs General Store property. Um, we also did get this high value in the poor water offshore of the southwest corner of the Springs General Store property. So here's the poor water result that we found at this specific station. Um, so that was actually a really surprising result because we didn't find it in some of our groundwater samples. We did find it in our surface water samples, which we expected. But the, finding it in the poor water was actually a pretty surprising result. So I think it would actually be worth doing some more testing on this and doing that microbial source tracking analysis because it happens to be <coughs> right offshore of this area where we know there is a, a strong ammonium plume that is potentially related to septic input. So um, we're also really confident that this wasn't because of any contamination problem. So we made sure that it was um, all of the procedures were designed to make sure that there was very little contamination. And we found, for example, at the on site, we found really high levels of fecal coliform in the surface water and very low levels when we sampled for um, pour water at that same station. So we're confident that there was no contamination or anything like that. So we're really interested in further identifying what's going on at this site in relation to fecal um, We know that there is a strong ammonium plume in this area, in the southwest corner of the Springs General <coughs> property, because of some of the background work that we've done along the years. And we measured nitrogen in different wells that were installed along the shoreline. So this is the uh, property line and the culvert is right here. So these are showing uh, TKN values. TKN is the sum of ammonia and organic nitrogen. And we found the highest concentrations were observed at 20 to 30 feet below ground level in the groundwater. And I'm just zooming out a little bit here because we kind of have to keep in perspective this whole area. So we, we know that there are residential septic inputs and the school, spring school, that's upgrading of our study area. Uh, another way to look at that data that I just showed is to look at it in what's called a contour plot. So basically, it as if I took a slice through the aquifer and you're looking at it from the side and then applying a color to the nitrogen concentration. So that's what this plot is on the left. Um, so these are, every color is a range of zero to two milligrams per liter. So we're looking at depth below grade and then horizontal distance in feet. And again, this is right in that southwest corner of the Springs General Store area. So you can see that we have this high nitrogen and specifically ammonia in this 25 to 35 foot range. Mm -hmm. um, it's unlikely that the septic, uh, that the plume is related to the on-site wastewater treatment from the general store itself. And we've, we've kind of deduced that because of these groundwater flow models. So this is uh, related to that Suffolk County watershed plan that Dr. Gober referenced. We have access to some of the water table elevation contour data. So the, what you're seeing here is that every blue line is a water table elevation modeled 
contour. And what, what this tells us is that the groundwater flow is actually perpendicular to these light blue lines. So if we look perpendicular to the light blue lines and we follow that forward, we can kind of look to see that this plume is kind of moving from in this direction. So we've deduced that the general store itself is really not the source of this plume because the spring general store septic is on the northern side of that property, <coughs> not the southwestern corner. Um, so we definitely think that the nitrogen sources are likely that medium residential and Although the Spring School did recently upgrade their system to an innovative alternative system, which is a low nitrogen system, because of the groundwater travel time in this area, the plume will likely be impacting the harbor for over five years. So groundwater travel time is relatively slow. Uh, so it's on the scale of years. Um, so we are focused on remediation, and, and that's what I mean looking at this site and how can we treat this ammonium. Ammonium is a little bit harder to treat than nitrate because um, it's in a more what we call reduced form of nitrogen. So it actually, we can't use a traditional permeable reactive barrier. There has to be this conversion of ammonium to nitrate and then we can kick it over to nitrogen gas. So we've been looking at how to do that, and one of the ways is to supply oxygen to the groundwater to help aerate, and microbes will naturally convert ammonium to nitrate when they're supplied with enough oxygen and under, under optimal conditions for their growth. So we installed gravel columns using what we, we have this instrument called a geoprobe, which uh, we installed installed gravel columns to 30 feet deep. And there, this is about one foot diameter. So quite large columns that go below ground. And then we were aerating the gravel column. So it's like a water saturated gravel column. We're aerating it and we were setting the pressure with these gauges and using a solar powered pump. So we installed sampling ports within each column, and then we have monitoring wells to see how this is performing. So just to show you, if I can display this. Everything is below ground, so it's a little hard to. So our manifold consisted of just PVC pipe that we're introducing air through this PVC manifold. And so you can think of this happening below ground, but I'm just showing it happening in a bench scale test in a beaker. And then with the gravel, our manifold is within that gravel, and then with the aeration, it's creating this upward flow. And it's exaggerated here in this bench scale test, but this is what is happening below ground, essentially. So we looked at what, what this aeration was doing. So we air and created these high oxygen conditions within each column. We found that the dissolved oxygen concentration increased, increased above baseline relatively quickly. We monitored it over several minutes and after the aeration stopped, we saw that oxygen was consumed and low oxygen water then mixed with the high oxygen water, which was naturally flowing through the columns. So we also know that oxygen is kind of diffusing columns in all directions, so we're actually getting more treatment area beyond just the columns themselves. And we found that about a half hour of aeration, we were able to bring that oxygen concentration above 10 milligrams per liter, and then, um, again, it came back down after about 24 hours because microbes are consuming that oxygen, potentially to convert the ammonia to nitrate, and just for their other microbial processes. Um, we also looked at the nitrogen concentrations within these gravel columns. So the air pressure supplied at depth seemed to create an upward flow of water in the gravel column, which allowed ammonium to be drawn in. So again, this is that contour plot that I showed earlier with depth below grade on the y-axis and horizontal distance along this x-axis here. So Pre-aeration, we had lower ammonium concentrations, and then post-aeration, we saw higher ammonium concentrations 
from deeper in the aquifer being brought into the column. And then we found the highest nitrate concentration in the shallowest depth intervals. So now the top plot is showing ammonium, this bottom plot is showing nitrate um, on the same color scale. So we pre-aeration, the ni highest nitrate was at about 20 feet below grade, and then post-aeration we have it um, at a shallower depth interval. So this system seems to be shuttling nitrate-rich water upwards, which is actually ideal because it reduces the depth of a future treatment system, and that creates cost savings in labor. So our current estimate for this site is that a 50-foot-long permeable reactive barrier in that southwest corner could prevent 212 pounds of nitrogen from entering this shallow culvert per year. Again, these are based on some assumptions. It's all like a pre-design assumptions, but based on our current data. So we submitted a request to um, the CPF committee to fund this work, to expand on some of the work that we've done, and to continue to install a permeable reactive barrier and to monitor it for several years. And we just actually found out today that the town board approved that, so that there were projects <laughs> um, submitted by Cornell and the Center for Clean Water Technology that got approved by the town board today, so great news. Um, we think that as this sequential barrier and aeration method in Akamonic Harbor is refined, it can be used elsewhere in East Hampton and on Long Island. We already know other areas in East Hampton and across the that have this ammonium plume issue. And so, like JTEC, this is, you know, Akabonic Harbor is one of the sites where we're focusing our efforts and it's kind of a state-of-the-art innovative system that can hopefully be applied elsewhere. So thank you very much. I just wanted to, to highlight and say thank you to the East Hampton Natural Resources Department, the Akabonic Protection Committee, and all of our collaborators. Thank you. Thank you for all the work, too. I mean, it's so amazing that all this is going on in, in that little region. You can go there and look at it, see the solar panels and the pumps, and it's, it's really interesting. Um, okay, our next um, presenters is Bob Timon and Nick and Jocelyn, yes, um, from South Fork Sea Farmers. Hi, I'm uh, Nick Cooper, and I was at uh, the APC meeting last year with um, uh, my internship partner, Sky. but sadly she couldn't make it today. She's, well, happily she's uh, at a scholarship night tonight, uh, so hopefully she's busy over there getting some scholarships. But um, I just wanted to introduce Jocelyn Garcia. She's a new intern who just started uh, yesterday, so. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so we're excited to have her working with us, uh, and we're just going to be presenting a bit of an update on um, the Akabonic Oyster Reef we already have implemented, and two more we plan to implement, hopefully this summer. So, a little bit about South Coast Farmers. We are a nonprofit organization, and our job is to um, educate and raise awareness. So uh, just a bit of uh, background on why uh, oyster reefs would be successful in Akabonic Harbor. Uh, firstly, uh, we're talking about eutrophication and algal blooms. 
So essentially, um, waste and agricultural runoff is making its way into Akabonic Harbor, um, particularly um, bringing uh, chemicals such as nitrogen and phosphate, uh, phosphorus. And um, these are creating perfect conditions for the growth of algal blooms, which feed off these contaminants. Uh, algal blooms release toxic chemicals into the waters, um, and they can also block sunlight from reaching the seafloor where important plants uh, need to do their job in the ecosystem. So essentially, oyster, uh, oysters are filter feeders, so they uh, potentially would be able to remove some of these contaminants, such as nitrogen and phosphorus, and prevent the growth of algal blooms altogether. Secondly, uh, oysters uh, can, when grouped in a reef, can help prevent erosion, um, which is a big problem in Akabonic Harbor for a lot of landowners uh, in that area. So essentially, uh, oyster reefs can reduce um, the energy brought by incoming waves and therefore uh, reduce their impact on the shoreline and reduce erosion. So for the method, which we've already used for the first oyster reef, and now we're hopefully going to be using for the next two oyster reefs, we have spat on shell in biodegradable bags, which we got from uh, the Netherlands, if I can remember. Um, we made sure that they were placed in a good location, which ideally was far from the inlet, because we didn't want the oysters to be flushed out by uh, incoming and outgoing tides, and pollution levels are higher. Uh, the further you get from the inlet, just because the water is not as flushed out. Uh, so we wanted to put the oyster reef in a place where it could actually make an impact on the pollution levels. We also made sure that there would be a solid bottom. We didn't want the oysters to suffocate in like 10 feet deep of mud. So uh, that was another important, uh, some, that was something important uh, as well. Uh, for us, community involvement, particularly with local schools, was also important. So for our first oyster reef, we had the spring school sixth graders come. Uh, they learned a bit about uh, what oysters were, what they did, uh, and then they helped us move bags from a boat onto the actual oyster reef. And for our next two reefs, we're hoping to get the Bridgehampton School and the East Hampton Middle School to help us with that. Finally, um, I just want to make a point that the <coughs> bottom layer of the oyster reef has some blank bags, so just uh, shells in a bag with none of the oyster spat, which we're monitoring for natural reef growth and natural reproduction and set onto those bags. This is a cross section of the reef. The bottom is three bags wide with, just like Nick said, um, blank bags, meaning the shells have no spat on them, and the top layer is two bags wide with Hemp twine, which is also biodegradable. So uh, I just want to talk a bit about the research that uh, Sky and I have done in our methods and research class in high school, which is basically where we choose a topic and work with it for three years. So Sky's research um, centered around oyster mortality and survival on the reef. So she took uh, two different samples. She took bags out of the water in December and in February and tracked the percent of oysters that were alive and the percent of oysters that had died. Clearly, uh, numbers like 1.8% and 3.1% are nothing too bad for in the middle of the winter. So uh, clearly, the oysters are surviving. And so they'll be able to do what they're supposed to do. Uh, she also looked in the bottom right graph. Um, she took uh, oysters and put them in a controlled environment. Um, and implemented uh, algae with algae cells with an algae paste and uh, tracked the oysters production throughout those 10 minutes and tracked cell counts of algae and as you can see the cell counts are going down as time is going on so she was confirming that the oysters are doing what they're supposed to be doing. So for my research, I looked at oyster growth um, and how water depth in the presence of benthic substrate affects that. So essentially, I took three bags. One was at, these were all measured at low tide, zero meters deep, approximately one meter deep, and approximately two meters deep. And I tracked their growth across nine months, uh, nine weeks, sorry. And um, 
looked at the average spat size. Uh, so the two meter deep bag grew the greatest. And at week six, the water depth got so cold that we hypothesized that the oysters actually went into hibernation and stopped growing for the rest of the winter. So that's why the research ends there. But hopefully, I'll be continuing my research next year. And Sky hopefully, will continue her research when she goes off to college next year. So each location was chosen for its distance from the inlet and its solid bottom. These were the areas um, conducive to reef development. Spawned from these three locations, including um, the Oyster Garden Project will produce a significant volume of larvae that will hopefully result in natural setting of the reef. So uh, just to go back to uh, the location of our first reef, which we've already implemented. It's just west of the no shell fishing marker on the south bank, so it's approximately there. Um, this is landing lane. Uh, this is landing lane, and we just make the trek over here, and this is where the first oyster reef is located. So reef two will be placed three to five feet from the marsh, e uh, marsh edge, running for approximately 90 feet. The reef is going to consist of a five bag base of clam, um, an oyster shell, and then the second layer is going to be three bags wide with the actual oyster spat on shell, which differs from the first oyster reef where we only had three bags wide on the bottom and two bags wide on the top. But we are going to make it less long so that the overall dimensions are five by 90, so it'll be equivalent to the area of our first oyster reef. And this is um, an aerial picture of where the reef is going to be located. So it's going to be located right next, right off of Laos Point Road, um, pretty far from the inlet, as uh, which we wanted. The third reef is essentially going to be pretty similar um, in structure to Reef 2. Um, again, it's going to be placed three to five feet from the marsh edge, running for approximately 90 feet, and has the five bags on the bottom layer, and it's going to be three bags wide on the top layer. And again, the overall dimensions should equal 50 square yards. Access to the water is provided at the southwest end of the reef um, at the adjacent landowner's request. Uh, and this is another aerial image. Uh, to the right is a more zoomed in image. And then to the left is uh, a more zoomed out image. So this reef is on the other side of Akabonic Harbor um, off of Gerard Drive, again, pretty far from the inlet. So um, this is the view of Akabana Harbor showing the three reef sites and the Oyster Gardening site. These three reefs are located as far as possible from the inlet along with the Oyster Gardening site. All four will contribute to the spring spawn and possible natural set on the, oyster, on the reefs. Um, so before we finish, I just want to acknowledge some support we've had from the community. So obviously the South Fork Sea Farmers is the lead organization in this whole process and they've been coordinating our projects, they've been fundraising, grant writing, doing really everything under the sun to help us out. Um, we also would like to thank the East Hampton Shellfish Hatchery for providing us with the spat on shell and a location um, near Three Mile Harbor for us to work with and uh, grow these spat while they were still young before putting them on the oyster reef. Uh, we'd like to thank the Akavonic Protection Committee for their continued support, local school districts, Spring School, Bridgehampton School, and the East Hampton Middle School, uh, as well as the Surf Riders Club and the Nature Conservancy. Thank you. I think we have no time left few minutes left for questions and answers. Five minutes. Anyone? Any questions for our presenters? Reggie? Yeah. I heard, um, I think it was the third presenter, uh, briefly mention uh, re reduction in pesticides. And uh, I have a uh, horror story that's still implanted in my memory about it. It's got to be 10 to 12, maybe a little couple more years. I was in my kayak about 7 a.m. right off Woodtick Island, heading out towards the channel. 
and a helicopter came over with two goons out and sprayed, took, I counted 13 passes over Woodtick Island. And then it went further north and sprayed again. So I called the town. I felt like I was in one of those Vietnam War movies. You know, this thing, this thing was right over my head. So uh, they said it was a county program. It happened every Tuesday. Now, I understand that it's been, it's been uh, lessened since then, but I'm, I'm just wondering if anybody has uh, the numbers on uh, what that decrease has been. They're not, they're not doing it at all? Okay. That's good. Do the contaminants remain in the oysters? Uh, yeah, so the oysters on our reef uh, should not be consumed. Um, they um, are not safe to eat because they have the pollutants in them. But that's a general rule. They retain the can. I think it's oh. like 50 gallons of water per oyster mm -hmm. per day. Uh, universally, all of those contaminants remain in the oyster. Am I correct in this, assuming that? Yeah, well, nitrogen and phosphorus are not dangerous to us. They're, they really should be considered just excess nutrients and not necessarily pollutants. Mm -hmm. So they, they, they do sequester the nitrogen and phosphorus and carbon into their shell and their meats. And uh, they're, they're fine for us to eat. And the only way we can actually remove them in the end is to actually remove the, the shellfish and eat them. And that's the way, one of the ways that we can re remove the nitrogen from the water. If you don't mind, I have another question, and that is, is it safe to shellfish in the Akabonic? Yeah, I would, the, the map that Dr. Gobler showed, I would go by that map. They're, they're very conservative, and it's a public health issue, and it's taken very seriously. So yeah, I, was, I, would, I would go by the map that Dr. Gobler showed in the light blue areas can be shellfish year-round, dark blue during the winter, and the red off-limits always. Thank you. Yeah, and the reefs, like, like uh, Nick said, the reefs are in uncertified water, so they shouldn't be harvested from. Uh, we do have uh, the audience at home uh, had a question about the normal expenses of septic upgrade that would be entitled to reimbursement by the town of East Hampton. What are the normal expenses of the septic upgrade that could be entitled to reimbursement by the town of East Hampton? Did you say something, Bob? No. no. Oh, okay. Um, I'm hoping to give this to somebody with the answer. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, we have to. Mr. Carlos, I threw up that it's 20, 20, up to 20,000 town rebate. The 20,000? 40, it's on the town website. Get all the information. Um, just have to close now. I, I want to um, acknowledge the work of uh, Dr. Christine Ganich in all of these programs. <laughs> this is my last um, event with the Akabonic Protection Committee. So I'm going on to other things in this area, similar vein, but um, 
I will miss it. And um, Nick Bryant, who is our treasurer on the board, is that yeah. <laughs> he would like to talk to you for a minute. Uh, Yes, it is a big deal that uh, Patrice will be leaving us. She's done extraordinary work. Um, my, my hope and prediction is that she will continue to work for the betterment of our natural environment in East Hampton. That's what I'm hoping she will do. If you look at this presentation and you saw the name of the Akabonic Protection Committee, repeated through it, you get an understanding of what this organization has done under Patrice and under Chris and under a lot of board members. We are, um, we're really making a difference. Um, we've, we've fundraised and we've used money where the town may have had money but they couldn't quite handle this because it wasn't in the way the law was written and that's where we have come in. It's not that we disregard the law, but we just aren't bound by some of those constrictions. Um, we are also at this point looking to have new members apply to our board. Uh, I'm gonna promise you one thing, I've never sat at a board meeting where there were fecal coliform samples on the table. <laughs> just in case anybody was was a bit wary of this. What you will find are people who are informed and in, who are working to educate themselves and people who are working together to take care of Akabonic Crick, as it was called, I think. And uh, Gerard Drive was Cape Gardner. This is, and we're not even talking about Native Americans. This Akabonic Harbor is a, is a gem. And that's why many of us have spent a long time working on it. And we invite you to consider joining this board. It would be really wonderful to have you. And I think, again, tonight's presentation shows you the kind of a work, work that we've been doing since 1985. Um, if you are interested, if you want to think about it, we're going to have a meeting on June 19th at Ashwag Hall. Uh, you could think about it till then. If you're interested in it now, you could let me know, okay? And this is what I'm gonna do. Does, does anybody have a cell phone with them? <laughs> text, would you text me if you are at all interested? I will give you my number and you can text me just to say you're interested and I will get back to you and discuss it in greater detail. So my number is 917. 225, are we seeing anybody texting? <laughs> 4145. And again, I am so proud of what, what you, you've seen here tonight. Um, I did take notes. I have to take notes, notes all the time. Don't be overwhelmed, uh, but be prepared to, be, to really learn some very useful, useful information about protecting our harbor. I thank you all for coming. You're wonderful. <laughs>